Excellent. Uh, so this presentation is about a fairly new subsystem of the kernel called HDMI CEC. CEC stands for Consumer Electronics Control. It uh, came in in 4.8 in staging and in 4.10 it was mainlined. And this is a status report. It actually is all a bit boring, much more interesting. Uh, out in the interstellar space, 21 billion kilometers, well, it has, still has 75 million to go before it gets there, but it's running at 17 kilometers per second, so it's two more months or so, and it's reached that distance. Uh, it's still working. It is still sending 24-7, uh, communicating with Earth at 160 bits per second. That's real time. But some exper experiments generate more data that's stored on tape, and every so often it's read out, sent to Earth, and that is done at uh, 1,400 bits per second. That's the minimum speed they can read out the tape. They expect that sometime next year the distance is too great, the signal too weak, and they can no longer read out those experiments. So they will be left with the 160 bits per second slick. But still, 40-year-old technology, it is absolutely amazing. So with a lot of embarrassment, I now introduce CEC, which at one meter does 400 bits per second. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm not sure. I probably maintain the slowest bus in the kernel. Uh, but, yeah. Anyway, what is CEC? Uh, it is an optional feature of the HDMI connector. It comes from the consumer electronics world originally, and it basically dates back all the way to uh, video recorders. The idea was you can put in a, turn it on, and it will automatically turn on the TV and do everything. Everything works theoretically, automatically. Uh, it is based on old AV-Link card standards, you know, those very big connectors. I never could understand why they were so big, but uh, it was, though, they're, they're actually it's standardized in those three standards. Don't bother buying them because it, it says very little. Uh, from what I can tell, they basically took the electrical low-level standard protocol and ported that to HDMI, and all the higher-level messages is completely new. I'm not sure, I never read the history of how this all came about, but uh, unfortunately, as I said, they took the electrical part and that was very, very slow. So you have an HDMI 2 cable, you do 4K P60, signals running around at gigahertz, and then you have this single line that is doing 400 bits per second. Uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, all these uh, DV oh, a DVD player, uh, AV receivers, displays, they all work together happily and you turn on one and everything else goes on. And it is implemented in, uh, what you, but you see it in HDMI receivers, transmitters, but also HDMI dongles. Got one here, that's what Johan referred to earlier. So basically, uh, HDMI goes in and it goes out to the display. This is typically connected to your PC. And the USB connector is what you use to control the CEC pin. It is primarily used for high, uh, for uh, home theater PCs, where most graphics cards, or actually no graphics cards at all, support CEC. So in order to turn on your TV, you need something like this. But it means that this subsystem is, this little, little framework actually occurs in different subsystems. Uh, the protocol over the line is very simple. You have one header byte with an initiator and a destination and 0 to 15 data bytes. And as I said, it's, you can almost type it yourself. There are two important uh, addresses involved. One of them is the physical address. The physical address comes from the EDID. EDID is part of every display and it provides display information. One of that is the physical address. A TV is always 0000, zero, zero, zero. and if it has, say, four HDMI ports, then the first HDMI port will receive one zero zero zero, the second two, the third three, and the last four. So every port has its own physical address. 
you can have different layers if they connect to an AV, AV receiver and then you will get another level. So you see that in the third device, that would be 2100. It represents the topology of your CEC, your, all your HDMI devices. This assumes that all the HDMI devices support CEC. If there's one in the middle that doesn't, then it's broken. Um, this also means you have at most five levels, where the TV is the first and then the leaf is, has four numbers, not four non-zero numbers. Everything else is invalid. There are some devices that, no, when it's invalid, you typically do not have CEC. The other is a logical address. It's a totally wrong name. It's a nickname. Think IRC, a chat room where you have your own nickname, and if it's for some reason already in use, you get some variant of it. This is the same. Uh, zero is, again, always the TV. And then you have uh, recording devices, tuners, playback, an audio system. That's the AV receiver. Uh, you can, it's brilliant, this one, because you can see that this is a horrible ad hoc protocol. So they started out, what well, we do we have? We have a recorder, we have some video recorders, uh, we have a TV, some video recorders, we have a tuner, a playback device, a video receiver. And then someone come up, hey, I have another tuner. Well, let's add that. And hey, I have another playback device. So they just added stuff until it was pretty full. Um, 12 and 13, in all the revisions, they were marked reserved. In the latest CC 2.0, they say it's a backup device. So if, if you can't get anything else, get one of it can't get any worse. Uh, 14 is a weird one. Uh, apparently, you can use it for a second TV. I never quite understood how that works out. 15 has a special meaning. Um, you can use it as, if, as an unregistered device. Then you have very limited capabilities. But typically, an HDMI switch can use 15. Or when you send a message, it's meant as a broadcast, so everyone receives it. So this is a, it's, it's nicknames. They have special meanings. It's not an address as in the sense of an IP address. Uh, this is an example uh, where you have a TV at the top, where physical address and logical address are all both zero. And you have recording devices, audio video receivers, all sorts of things connected, set top boxes. But you can see this is all consumer electronics. That's where this came from. Uh, it comes under various trade names. I don't know why they don't, just don't call it CEC, but they always want to have their own name. Why would you implement it? Uh, the CEC standards uh, calls it features. They basically separate all their messages into sets called a feature, and they deal with a specific uh, feature. Uh, I will list them fairly quickly. You can, you can download uh, HDMI 1.3 specification and you can read up a lot more about them. The ones in blue are a little bit special. So Cisco, the way, why did we make this? We do video conferencing and when you buy a codec as a customer, you hook it up to the TV and a call comes in, we need to wake up the TV. That's the core use case for us. Uh, we want to do more with it, but that's, that's key. I mean, if the call comes in and the TV doesn't go on, customer complains. Uh, we made a CEC compliance utility. That's open source. I will talk about that a bit later. And there you can test if another device, uh, how well it complies to the CEC standard. So you can test your TV. How good is it? Uh, we wrote lots of tests. Uh, the one in blue are very well done because they were important for us, so we really did in-depth testing. Uh, the others, we do very basic tests, uh, but it's definitely not in-depth. Volunteers welcome. It's open source. We would love to extend that, but it's not relevant to what we are doing, so it's unlikely we will continue uh, adding tests for that. But if you're doing a TV software, uh, tuner box, whatever, uh, would be great to improve this. So one touch play, that's the main, main one you want to play, you turn on the TV. Uh, system standby, opposite direction, uh, I don't, I'm done, just turn everything off. 
Uh, recording typically comes for video recorders, uh, timer programming, deck control, tuner control, con some limited control over the display menu. Remote control pass-through, that's another important one. So you can use a single remote to use the TV, AV receiver. Um, I got to say this is more theory than practice. Would be nice if everybody properly implemented it, but I think my, uh, my own Denon uh, amplifier doesn't do it right. So it's, it's not perfect, uh, which is sort of the whole theme of this talk. It, it's a nice idea, but they don't quite do enough to implement it correctly. System audio control, um, OSD name transfer, so that's nice. You can tell uh, I'm called on, I don't know, Apple TV, and the TV will show up that input as being an Apple TV. So you can tell them what your name is. Power status, is the device in standby? Is it on or is it transitioning to one of those states? Uh, routing control is important if you have a switch in between. So it will, if you say I want to become active, then the switch will automatically route you to the TV. System information, what is your physical address, or some similar things. A uh, fairly new feature introduced by 2.0, but allowed to be implemented in 1.4, but very few do. For Well, I think it's a great feature. Uh, it tells you the delay of your display. So if you're sending out, if you have external speakers, uh, the, the display will take some time to delay to, to process the image. So you need to get the speakers in sync with the display. And this will allow the display to tell, say, an AV receiver what its delay is. It's very useful because I had to manually program that into my AV receiver through the menu. But so few displays do that. I don't know why not, because this is ideal for AV receivers. Uh, Vendor-specific commands uh, that allows you to, you know, improve the cooperation if you have two identical vendor systems. Um, Try to avoid it, because it's obviously not compatible with anything else. Audio rate control, never understood the purpose of that. Audio return channel, it's much more interesting. Um, it allows you, it's actually an older feature of HDMI, where normally the audio goes from source to the sync, the TV, but you can also do it the other way around. Uh, but in that case, you need a CEC protocol to enable it and disable it. Capability discovery and control, uh, that is really for an HDMI Ethernet feature where you can do networking over HDMI. Nobody uses this. You can pretty much ignore it. Very few devices can do this. So how is it implemented in the kernel? Um, so we, have, we create a CEC device, um, obvious name. The driver, what is what the problem with the CEC protocol is really a mix. Some of the, the messages are really low level, some of them are high level, and it depends on exactly what your use case is, where you need to process the message. A good example is audio return channel. Um, if your audio is hardwired through some other mechanism, it's actually the case for us, so it's basically always on, you don't have to do anything then you can handle those messages in user space. But if, you, if it's going through some ALSA driver and you need to enable something, open ports, whatever, then you need to do it in the kernel. So the framework has to be uh, flexible enough that you can do things either in user space or in kernel space. There are currently no drivers upstream that do things in kernel space other than the core messages, but they are handled by the framework but it is absolutely possible to do that. And in some cases, you will have to do that. Uh, I wanted to have as much of the low-level framework, low-level protocol interaction. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, drivers should only implement the low-level issues with CEC. The framework deals with the details of the protocol, and especially with the asynchronous aspects, because it is so slow you don't want to do any blocking weights. So you, and if you send a transmit and you expect a reply, there may be all the messages in between the transmit and the reply. 
And you want the framework to be able to figure out what is the reply, if you get the reply to which transmit that belongs. You don't want to do that in user space because it's, it's a lot of work. It's asynchronous, always tricky. Let the framework do that for you. There are also lots of things in the protocol where um, certain messages can only be sent so often. Uh, when you lose this connection, when you get a disconnect and you need to claim a new logical address, you should start with the latest that you have. So hopefully you will get the same one back. All sorts of little rules that are very difficult to do in user space. That's what the kernel is for. That, that single place where all this stuff happens. Um, uh, the core messages are handled automatically for you because they're pretty standardized what you should do. There's no reason for user space to handle that. Uh, there is a feature in CEC that allows you to monitor messages. So typically when you send a message, you say it's either a broadcast message, goes to everyone, or it is directed to that device. Most hardware will only accept messages if they're broadcast or sent to us. If it's sent to someone else, they will be ignored. You have a monitoring mode in several adapters where you can also receive those messages. So you can sniff the bus. It is great for debugging. Uh, actually, the CEC 2.0 standard recommends that you do that. Um, but it is not on by default because if you read the data sheets, they tend to come with, well, you can do this, but we don't recommend it. It's for debugging only. So you explicitly have to enable this. And again, not all hardware can do this, or at least they don't tell in the public data sheet how it should be done. All the core code is in drivers media CEC. As I mentioned, it's sort of spread out between different subsystems. So for transmitters, uh, CEC implementations are typically in DR uh, GPU DRM. For video receivers, they're typically in drivers media. For USB devices, they're in drivers media as well. Uh, I'm a subsystem maintainer of drivers media, so where do I put it? I put it in drivers media. It means that it is a bit awkward when you have to do DRM drivers because you may have to do it in two things in two places, two subsystems, which is always, I won't say painful, but it's more work, harder to coordinate. Um, you want to be able to make, assemble, and decode CEC messages, both in the kernel and the user space. So I wrote a kernel public header, which has a lot of static inlines that you can use to assemble messages, make, make CEC messages, and decode them. It's a public header, so it's available by user space. It is dual license, GPL and BSD. And you should use that. Don't roll your own because every CEC implementation that I've seen before now, they always made their own shit. Um, it has a full implementation of the whole protocol. Um, so it should be, uh, should be easy to use. We also added an optional integration to the remote control framework. So the remote control pass-through feature where you can receive remote control presses, they can automatically go through the remote control framework. Currently, that's only receive. There is work being done to also go the other way. That you can, it's what's called an, normally it's called an infrared blaster, where you actually send messages. And we want to be able to do that with CEC as well. Uh, yesterday, a patch series was posted that would prepare the ground to be able to do this. Would be nice. So if you write on a driver, this is what you have to implement. Uh, just a little bunch of low-level operations. The one in blue are required, the others are optional. Uh, add up enable, enable disable the hardware, simple. Logical address, so when the framework figured out what your logical address is going to be, it will give it to you. Usually the hardware has to be programmed so it knows what it should listen to. So if it's a playback device, you get logical address four, then it should accept messages sent to logical address four. You can have up to four logical addresses in one adapter. Although the CEC 2.0 standard only allows for a maximum of two. And then there are special combinations. 
Uh, many hardware, CEC hardware, only accepts a single logical address. So it's, if you need multiple logical addresses for some reason for your use case, then you have to be you have to pay attention to your hardware. Um, then there is the transmit, where you transmit a message. The other thing you need to do is an interrupt handler. So you get an interrupt when the message is finished. Obviously, at 400 bits per second, you don't want to do a polling wait, a busy loop. It speaks for itself. Uh, so you get an interrupt, and it says the tra transmit has succeeded, or there was an error, and then you call the function at the bottom, transmit done, where you tell the framework, okay, this transmit is finished, and this is the status. Same when you receive a message, you also get an interrupt, and you pass the message on to the framework. Um, these functions have to be called in, uh, cannot be called an interrupt context. So just so you know, they use a mutex. Um, it's not exactly a performance critical thing. Of the other functions, monitor all enable, you would implement that if your hardware can do monitor bus sniffing. Um, some status information that you can dump. Uh, sometimes you have some have to freeze some memory. The received operation, this received op can be used to handle high level commands. If you need to do that in the kernel, you can do it there. Public API, um, get capabilities, what can I do? Get set physical address. Uh, set physical address, you have to be, as I said, you normally get it from the EDID. You should, the, the HDMI transmitter, should tell the CEC adapter what the physical address is when it receives the ED, EDID. You should not uh, require the user to set it because that's very painful for an application. And after all, it's all in the kernel, so you, you have that information, you just need to link it up. There are a few exceptions. Again, USB-C devices like this, you don't know to which HDMI input it is associated, so you have to do that in user space. If you want to submit a driver for CEC that is related to an HDMI transmitter, but you haven't made a hook yet, then you can submit it, but it will go to staging. And I won't mainline it until you made the, the hook up. There is a notifier mechanism. The, the, the reason I allow this is that because it's in two subsystems, it can take time before you are both ready. And I'm okay with accepting the driver without the physical address setting link until you've done that, but only in staging. I've done that before and it works out well. Get set logical address, that's a very important one. That's where you tell the adapter, what am I? Am I a recording device? Am I a playback device? Am I a TV? Uh, you don't, the kernel doesn't know that. That has to come from user space. You don't actually set a logical address. You set what you are. So if you say, I'm a tuner, then the framework, when you connect to a display, it will try to find out what is the first free logical address for a tuner. As I said, like IRC, when you log in and someone and there is already you, you, your nickname is already in use, you get a, another free nickname that's a variant usually of what you had. It works the same. So you don't actually set a logical address. You set what you are. When you get it, then you get your actual logical address. Get set mode. Um, So you can be in two modes, basically, as an initiator, where you send something and possibly wait for the reply, or you can be a follower, where you just sit, you're basically a demon, and you sit back and you wait for messages and you process them and give the right reply or take an action. Uh, you can be both. And there are also some additional things where you can be in exclusive mode so nobody else can, can mess around with your CEC adapter. So you can set a file, sort of a file system mode. It is tailored for CEC with the CEC um, terminology and, and how it should work in practice. Uh, manual, the, the documentation has a lot more information there. Receive and transmit speaks for itself. A uh, special feature for transmits, you can ask it to wait for the reply. So you can have two modes, either just send it, send and forget, or say send it and wait for this reply. 
It's extremely useful. I, I did it for purely for selfish reasons, because it's so nice to be able to just send a message, wait for the reply, without having to use a daemon or all sorts of special things. It makes it very nice to interactively test things. So I have this AV receiver. How does it work with CEC? Can I do this? Can I do that? Um, purely for selfish reasons, but it's extremely handy. Uh, so from event handling, the main thing is to detect a disconnect or a reconnect. So when your physical address and or logical address change, you get these events. And a debug file where you can see the adapter status. Now, let me pull up my... Now the real meat. So, you need a physical address for CEC. Physical address you get from the EDID. In order to be able to read the EDID, a display has to set a pin high. It's called the hot plug detect pin. If it's high, that signals to whoever is connected that you can read the EDID. So no, no hot plug detects, then there is no physical address, then you have no CEC, then there, you also cannot send any message to wake up the display. Most displays, when they go in standby, the hot plug detect stays high. You can still read the EDID, you know there is a display, you can still send messages, but some displays, when they go in standby, they pull the hot plug detect low. At that moment, you have no idea what is happening. There may be nothing connected, no TV at all, or they may really still be there, and they still have an active CEC adapter, and you can still send messages, but you have no way of telling that. Uh, as far as I could tell, in the CEC 1.3 and 1.4 standards, they said nothing about this. In the 2.0, there is a very, very tiny print. They mentioned that this is actually allowed. Even there, it is a bit dubious, because they mostly talk about mobile devices, but okay. Um, so the idea then is that I only learned about this when I had the framework already uh, finished. So we added support that you could actually send a message to a TV when there is no hot plug detect, as a special exception. Not all hardware can do this, by the way. So uh, most specifically, the Odroid devices for the Exynos 4 and 5, they have a level shifter between the HDMI connector and the SOC. And the level shifter, the hot plug detect is hooked up to the level shifter. When the hot plug detect goes away, the level shifter goes away as well. And all the CEC signals stop at the level shifter, so they never reach the SOC. That's a complete board-specific thing, and you can actually signal that in a device tree, and it will be shown as a capability. Uh, needs hot plug detect. That means that if you have a board like that, and a TV that pulls down hot plug detect, you cannot wake it up. Period. Just, it's blocked. Uh, so, okay, then you think, great, um, I just send a message. I have no hot plug detect, but I just send a message, and then we'll see if it wakes up or not. Sadly, there are displays that make that very hard. So, I won't name names, but there is one display, and I really had to debug that at a low level. What is happening is that every five seconds, it sends a vendor CEC message. It's in standby, there's no hot plug detect, but CEC works, so it's sending a message. You can send an image view on message, that's to wake up, only once. So, you've, after, when you, you, you just have to send that immediately. If the TV receives first another message, like a poll message, and then the image view on, it will not accept that other message. Until it sends that vendor message again, and then it resets some state machine. So, the, and that's, this is a new display. This is not some old crappy thing from the past. No, these are produced today. So the only way you can reliably wake up a TV is just send this message. Nothing else, send this message. Then it will work. Um, if you're unlucky and you have an AV receiver that is pulling all the time, then you can't wake it up either because 
the basic the TV sees something else, and only then your image, your home, then it won't work again. This is hard. These are all sorts of undocumented, crappy things that really should not be happening. Uh, it is completely out of spec the way that display behaves. But they're there. You have to be able to take care of it. Uh, another thing that we see switching between inputs on the TV, for some reason they toggle the hot plug, the text goes down, it comes up again. So again, your application has to, has to be able to deal with that. Um, utilities. So it's not enough to make a framework for this. You also need to provide utilities. CEC, CTL. Um, for, by the way, for those who know me and have seen the video for Linux utilities, they will see a lot of similarities between CEC and video for Linux. I wrote them both, so I'm to blame. Uh, CEC control, you can Swiss Army knife of CEC. You can configure them, you can send any message, you can do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, interesting new thing, there is a CEC extension made for hotel displays. And I added support for that to CEC CTL, uh, just for fun. It was there, I had a hotel display. What do you do as an engineer? Very nice also, I uh, will say that a little bit more about that later. You can, with the right hardware, you can do low level monitoring. So most hardware is high level. You give it a message and it will send it out for you. There is some hardware, including one that I wrote, where it's all done through this GPIO pin, where you have full control over the bus. So you can monitor exactly what is the traffic over the bus by the voltages, if it goes low and high, and you can analyze that. So if there are issues, this is a very nice way of getting a very detailed view of the CEC bus. A CEC follower that is used for testing, it will emulate the device. So it will emulate that you are a TV or emulate that you are a playback device. So it will emulate high level messages. So if you want to test something and you haven't made a daemon yourself, you can use this in the meantime. Uh, CEC compliance, that's the most interesting one. You can test, it has two functions. One is to test yourself. So it has a whole bunch of unit tests, system tests for your own adapter. Uh, to be honest, it mostly tests the framework, not so much your driver because it's so simple. Uh, but you can also use it to test the remote device. You can test this, the compliance of a TV. And that is really nice. As I said, not all features are implemented, or if they are, they are very coarse tests that are being done. Obviously, the features that we had needed, they are fairly detailed. Uh, but this is great, and I really hope that people will post some patches for it and improve it further because this is ideal just to see how well do things work. Current status, it is after all a status report. So this was a great time for me to do this because a lot of drivers went in, in 4.14. Um, the ones that have been around for a bit is again the Pulse 8. That's this, this one because it's very popular. There's another one uh, mostly available, uh, pretty much only available in the US. You can buy it else, you can have it shipped here, but then the shipping costs twice as much as the thing itself. For DRM drivers, uh, Samsung, they have been in for a while. ST Electronics, Raspberry Pi, very nice. Um, Synopsys Designware, that's, that's an IP that is used in lots of single board computers as well. I think also, the, I think also this one, by the way. Uh, there's another AM Logic that is specific to the AM Logic. All winner went in. So uh, I've been told that CEC is not tested on this one, but it's supposed to work. But you have to be aware that the CEC pin is mixed in with an audio pin, so you need to set a, a jumper correctly. Um, if it doesn't work, tell uh, Kevin. Uh, tell Neil, Neil Armstrong. He's the one guy doing that. He can fix it. Well, unless I can take this one home, then I do it. Video for Linux, uh, video receivers, analog devices are well supported. Uh, Vivid, Vivid is a virtual video driver, so it emulates HDMI 
capture devices. Uh, and I add a CEC to that. So if you don't have any CEC hardware, but you want to play around with it, you can load that driver, and you get automatically a CEC, or two CEC devices, one for an HDMI input and one for an output. Uh, very nice, very recent. Uh, Jose Abreu from Synopsys did the official CEC compliance tests using this framework. Uh, there was one corner case that I had to fix, very obscure, uh, that will go in in 4.14 and will be backported all the way back to 4.10. Otherwise, we passed. So I'm very pleased about that. Also very interesting, Linux is the only OS that has CEC support. That is core of part of the OS itself. Work in progress, OMA 4. Uh, one thing I want to tell, if you want to add a uh, CEC driver, usually it's about two days' work, because they're very simple. OMA 4 was definitely not two days' work. It was a heck of a lot longer, because it were all sorts of different layers that had to be set up in just the right order, and there were bugs in the driver that I found that I had to work around, and my God. Hopefully it will go in 4.15. Uh, Qualcomm Dragon Board is supported. Uh, also waiting, should go, hopefully go in in 4.15 as well. For the tagger, I have support, still waiting for a review. DisplayPort CEC tunneling, now that's very interesting. I have one here, it's a USB-C to HDMI adapter. The DisplayPort has a feature where it can do CEC. That's specifically for adapters towards HDMI. Um, there is one very popular chipset for these adapters that supports it. The big problem is that most vendors do not hook up the CEC pin. So you have all this nice support, but it's not working because they didn't hook it up. Why don't they hook it up? Because there's no OS that supports it. So it's chicken and egg. There are two adapters that actually did hook it up, and they work fine. Uh, I also asked a colleague, I I'm hopeless with soldering stuff. Anything beyond the screwdriver is, is too difficult for me. Luckily, I have colleagues who are good, and they, they took a display port to HDMI adapter with the right chip inside, hooked up the CEC pin, and then it works. So I would really like to get this in, so I can talk to vendors and say, hey guys, hook up the stupid pin. The weird thing is, if, you have, if this works, and if this actually is being done, then if you buy a graphics card with, say, display ports, outputs, and HDMI outputs, and you have to write adapters, then you can make CEC work for display ports, but for HDMI, there's no support. It's insane. Uh, capture driver and the GPIO driver was merged, so there you can use a single GPIO pin to drive a CEC line. Very nice. Things to do. Um, wake on CEC where you can, it's basically the image view on. Some hardware has support that they can monitor the bus and automatically send a signal to wake something up. Uh, the, there's quite a lot of differences in implementations and I don't know how to do it. So I, for now I just sit back and wait until someone actually needs it and can come up with a good idea. I would love to get patches for CEC compliance to improve it. Um, when you have low level access to the CEC bus, like with GPIOs, then you can do error injection. I have code for that, it works. The API needs to be cleaned up, and I want to, do, to improve the, the low-level pin analysis that is part of CEC CTL, where you can actually analyze what is happening on the bus at that low level, and it should report those error injections correctly as being errors. Uh, it's work in progress. It's mostly API work, where I'm still not happy about. Uh, last thing that is brand new, because the patch series was only posted yesterday, and that is looking towards adding, uh, to be able to send remote control messages through the remote control framework. Not just receive as it is today. So, I prepared a demo. You can't see it because it's due to the way this is designed. I will show it later during the coffee break. But I have a picture as well. So, it's a Raspberry Pi, a breadboard, uh, two HDMI connectors. In the right hand corner, I have an adapter board for, the, for an HDMI receiver Toshiba HDMI to CSI bridge. 
and you have the Raspberry Pi transmitter. For the two connectors on the breadboard, the CEC pins are broken out and go to GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi. I've done the same with Hot Plug Detect. The, the CEC GPIO driver can, of course it needs the CEC pin, it can also look at the hot plug detect pin because of all the issues with hot plug detect going away and doing all sorts of weird things, it's very useful if you can monitor it. It doesn't do anything with it, it's just monitoring it. So, wish me luck. So I've run this already, initialization script. The first one fills in the EDID for the receiver. Nothing works unless you have an EDID on the receiver. So it just fills in a basic HDMI EDID. Then uh, the first adapter, so if I don't specify anything, it is CEC0. First one is configured as a TV. CEC0, let me just show it. That's the HDMI to CSI receiver, so that's your TV effectively. And you can see physical address 000, uh, logical address uh, that's below, logical address zero, you see some primary device type, some, some more information. Um, so D1, CEC1, is set up as a recording device. This is a GPIO pin. So you can see here, CEC GPIO as a driver. Uh, it can do lots of things, including monitor pin, saying that I can do low level pin monitoring. Uh, this is configured as a recording device. Since this is a GPIO thing, and it's not connected directly to an HDMI uh, controller, I explicitly need to specify the physical address. Uh, I do not configure the second GPIO pin, that will be used for monitoring only. So you can see here, there is, uh, there's no physical address, FFFF, no logical addresses are set. And the last one, D3, is set up as a playback device. So that's the Raspberry Pi internal ACMI receiver. The physical address is got from the EDID, I never set it, it's completely transparent through the ACMI transmitter. And it's configured as a playback device. Oh, and finally, I start CEC followers to emulate the high level protocol for those. So the CEC follower just reads out the, the configuration of the CEC adapter. And then it sees, hey, I'm a TV, so I act as a TV, or a playback device, I act as a playback device. So all you need to do is running in the background. So first test that I wanted to do. Um, I first start on CEC2, that is monitoring. I'm just going to monitor on the low level. I store the results, uh, the an analysis outputs in a file. Uh, and the other one, I monitor on a high level, so that's not monitor pin, but that is that's minus capital M, that is just monitoring the high level protocol. I sleep a second, and then I just see what, what, is, what devices do I see. So if you look at the output here, I'm testing with the GPIO driver, it's a recording, it sees the TV, it interrogates it, what CEC version does it support, physical address, all various types and, and things. Then it sees the playback device and it does the same. And at the end you see a small topology, so how, how is everything hooked up? So the monitor file, it, it just so shows all the high level, what messages are being received, what, what does it see, all of 
traffic wise. And so the low level analysis there you actually see every byte, whether it's act or not, whether it's the end of message, how long did it take. So that is a much more detailed view of the bus. And just a quick run of a compliance test. So here is actually going through all sorts of different tests and just see what, what can it do, how does it work. It will actually have a failure all the way at the end. That's a bug in the test that I just fixed, but it's not yet here. Uh, so this gives a great overview of what is available. I'm just leave that running. Oh. Bunch of links. Uh, specification, uh, the, uh, the wiki page has some links to the 1.3 and 1.4 specification. Where is the source code for the media stuff? The utilities are in V4L utils. It's a misnomer, it should be called media utils, but I can't get them to rename it. All sort of documentation. Uh, I have a status page where I keep up to date how, much, how many drivers are in, what is the current status of it. It also has information on how to make this, what is basically a CEC debugger. It's about 80 bucks all in all, with a Raspberry Pi. Um, Pulse8, they have a libcec library that is used in a lot of devices or a lot of applications because it was the only thing available. Uh, someone wrote a driver for our framework as well. It's not merged, I'm not sure if that will ever, will ever happen. Uh, once this has been rolled out in enough drivers, then I personally don't see any reason why you want, would want to use libcec. But at least there is a patch and my email. Questions? Thank you, Eddie. Um, uh, oh, may I? From my understanding, the quality of the implementation will vary from one vendor to another. Yes. Um, surely because of the software which is running inside the devices. And maybe sometimes due to the quality of the transmission of, the, of, of this wire. And my question would be, would it be interesting using your framework to make some CSC further? S -s throwing stupid message and to see how the device is uh, answering. And then if after a time of fusing uh, it, running the compliance still works, it means uh, the stack is uh, reliable against uh, weak devices? Um, I think fuzzing makes more sense once you know that it actually, that it can actually handle normal messages. <laughs> uh, so one, one, there's actually the very, pretty much the very first test of the compliance test is to send an unknown message, see what happens. It should reply with a feature aboard, but nobody does that. I don't know why not. It's the first test in the official compliance test. Well, not the first, but it's one of the tests in the official compliance test, but they all fail. I tell them that, and, uh, yeah. Okay, we're not gonna change that. It's very, so uh, it's certainly possible, but I think it's a bit premature. But uh, I accept patches. So if you want to make one, 
I absolutely feel free. Thank you. Do you think that the lack of quality of current implementations is just the lack of something like you just did? Do you believe that in the future people start using what you did and this will benefit us all? It's certainly my hope. Um, one problem has been that who's been using CEC? There are all these consumer electronics. Now, most people can't work with those unless you work for a company like that. Otherwise, you, yeah, what can you do? So it is very nice if all these embedded systems that people can buy and laptops through a, a display port to, or to Type-C to HDMI adapter, if you suddenly can start to use it. And then you get a much bigger group of developers who are actually interested in this and who can look at things and start complaining. Uh, it has become better. So in the past, you, you had a lot of lock-in. So, uh, a TV of Vendor X would only really work well with a Blu-ray player of Vendor X. Vendor Y would miss out with features or would not be accepted or whatever. Uh, my impression is that that has been improved a lot. So vendors can no longer expect customers to buy everything from them. So interoperability has become better. But still there is definitely a lot of issues there. And yes, indeed, I'm hoping that this will improve things a lot. And if you have a Raspberry Pi and it's, you know, it's all the way up to the latest standard, uh, I think that would be, hopefully people will do more with it. Um, I discovered, uh, discovered the CC uh, at the beginning of the year when I bought a Chromecast device. And I discovered that uh, I was able to wake up my TV uh, through the Chromecast mm -hmm. after I... Uh, uh, went in the menu of the TV and activated CEC because it wasn't activated by default, I don't know why. It was a Sony TV or something like that. Uh, did you add some help from the Chromecast people at Google? Because I guess that they have a lot of uh, tests out there of CEC. Uh, no. I didn't try, it. I didn't reach out, out to them either, to be honest. Um, I learned recently that the reason why they often do not enable CEC by default is power consumption. Because when it's in standby, it has to be less than half a watt or something. And if they enable it, then it's a bit above that. Um, I, that's more to do with their hardware implementation because there are CEC chips out there that have a micro watt or whatever, extremely slow, extremely low power consumption. So it's definitely possible to do it like that. But you know that's the reason why it's often disabled. I, I asked them myself actually because I couldn't understand it, but that was the reason. No other questions? Then I thank you all. <laughs>